Welcome to 6120. I'm a physicist and I wonder why you're here to listen to me about art. Why am I giving a talk on art? I was born in the Netherlands. And my interest in art goes back to my childhood. My parents, even though they had a modest income, started to buy contemporary art from Dutch artists when I was 10 years old. My father took me very often to galleries, and soon I went to the galleries on my own. I also recall that I wrote an article in my high school newspaper on art. I tried to find a copy. I couldn't, and maybe that's better, because I think if I would see the text now that I may be very embarrassed, to say the least. In senior high, I often took my friends to museums, and I was always their museum tour guide. Now, besides physics, art has always played a very important role in my life. I started to collect art like my parents and my closest friend, Peter Stroiken, is a well-known Dutch artist. I have collaborated with him over the years on various of his projects and also with Otto Piene, who is one of the leading members of an avant-garde movement in Germany in the mid-50s. He became the director of the Center for Advanced Visual Studies here at MIT, he is still a very good friend. And then there is my son Chuck, who is in the audience, who is the founder and the director of the Art Interactive Museum in Cambridge. What more do you want? <laughs> at home, I have a dozen books on physics, but at least 300 books on art. So the ratio is about 20 to 1. That's, of course, my situation at home. Believe me, it's different in my office here at MIT. I put the 10 books uh, on art here on the desk, and if you want to, during the intermission, you can take a look at them. I hope you will treat them with loving care like we do. In order to have proper balance and to keep the ratio with physics 20 to 1, I added half a book of physics. <laughs> I cut it very nicely this morning. Take my word of, for it, it's really half a book. So for those of you who are not interested in art, there is your chance. And needless to say that my significant other, Susan Kaufman, who is also here, and I go to every conceivable art exhibit in the Boston area and also uh, to New York. So my friends and students have urged me for many years to give talks on arts, but I've always resisted this because, let's face it, I don't have a formal training in art history. Uh, Susan, uh, over the past few years, increased the pressure and I decided two years ago to start an art quiz at the Center for Space Research. Every week I put up one a reproduction of one works of art by a world famous, well known artist. And then the idea is, of course, that people should tell me then um, who the uh, artist is. I'd like to show you the bulletin board at the center. So you see that here. On the right side is always the new work of art, of which the, uh, the artist is not known. And there is the box where you can put in your answer and your name. At the end of the year, there are three prizes, by the way. And on the left side of this bulletin board is always the answer of last week's artist. And I add some information about what the artist did, where he came from, and about the movement uh, that he perhaps was a member of. Now, there may be uh, quite a few experts already in my audience. And if you are, then you cannot possibly miss to see some works of art by the pioneers that I will highlight today. You may actually spot a Kandinsky. And maybe you will see a Matisse. And of course, there must be somewhere on that bulletin board a Mondrian. And a Van Gogh can, of course, not be missed. And what can you do without Cezanne? And if you have very good eyes, and you know your art very well, you may even spot somewhere in the middle an extremely famous work of art by Malevich. It was made in 1915. This uh, week, we have a uh, work of art by an artist. I can't tell you the name yet. And if you know it, please keep it secret. Uh, we haven't had a... Uh, any uh, correct answer yet? 
So here are the pieces of paper, you see them on the right, and you can write your name on it, and then the artist, and then you put it in the box. <laughs> and what would be interesting for me is to see if those of you who don't know the name of the artist, perhaps after my talk, when you're educated, maybe you do know. I gave my first art talk in high school. That is about 50 years ago. And my second I gave in 1979. It's exactly 25 years ago. I was invited to give the rather prestigious Piet Mondrian lecture for 900 people in Amsterdam, and this evolved from my collaboration with Peter Stroiken. And so it occurred to me that it may be a nice tradition given the fact that I have no formal training in art history, to give a talk once in 25 years. <laughs> and so now you know why you're here. And the title of my talk is Looking at 20th Century Art Through the Eyes of a Physicist. So you're going to look at art through my eyes, but my eyes are closed. Look carefully. You may not have noticed that, but remember, you get what you paid for, and that wasn't very much. <laughs> I will only talk about the first quarter of the 20th century. During that period, art evolved very rapidly uh, with pioneering contributions in quick succession in a way which is unprecedented in the entire history of art. This was the obvious period of my choice. My second choice would have been the third quarter of the 20th century, when most of the pioneering contributions came from the United States. So perhaps I will do that next time, 25 years from now. <laughs> of the hundreds of names of the very famous artists from this early part of the 20th century, I will only talk about the works of perhaps two dozen artists. I will largely focus on the pioneering breakthroughs. Like in science, the pioneering work is the most fascinating and the most important. I have here a very crude outline, which I will follow. Some of the sequences are arbitrary because many movements occurred uh, simultaneously. Now, to cover the first quarter of the 20th century the right way would require a dozen courses over a period of at least three years. I mean, cubism alone, that should take at least one whole term. But I will do all this in two hours. <laughs> so I will only focus on a few highlights, and I will leave out a lot. I won't say a word about surrealism. I will not even mention the important contributions of the Russian constructivists. I won't mention the word Bauhaus. And much to my embarrassment, I won't even talk about the greatest sculpture of the entire 20th century, which was Constantin Brancusi. And he did already his work in the first quarter of the 20th century. So first, I'd like to take you briefly back to the last quarter of the 19th century when the French Impressionists made their giant contributions. And perhaps you know some of those names. Monet. All of you must have heard of Monet. Degas. Pizarro. And Renoir. Just to name a few. I'll show you a Monet. This is a Monet from 1891. It's one of his many haystacks. The Impressionists were interested in the objective recording of life without strong personal emotions. They tried to capture an impression of what the eye see at a particular moment, and they painted largely directly from nature. And this is a striking example. They often use bright colors, 
and also coarse brush strokes, as you can see, and that was bewildering and shocking at the time. Keep in mind that those works that all of us admire, and we even call them beautiful, were ridiculed at the time and were received with great hostility. We have a wonderful collection of impressionists, both at the MFA as well as the Folk Art Museum, so many of you may get to see these works. Now this movement was followed by what is called post-impressionism. Post-impressionists are, for instance, Van Gogh. And if you really know how to say Van Gogh, the chances are 99% that you're Dutch. <laughs> but I will be kind to you. I will mispronounce this the way all of you do, and I will call him Van Gogh. <laughs> so we have Van Gogh, and then we have Gauguin, and there is Cézanne and Seurat. And they moved away from Impressionism in very different ways. And I will show you examples of each. So they let go the idea of objectivity, which was so important in Impressionism. And Van Gogh and Gauguin also showed very strong emotional involvement, which is a real no-no in Impressionism. Van Gogh is called the father of Expressionism. Expressionism allows for the distortion in color, the deliberate, deliberate distortion in color and shape, and also exaggerations for emotional effects. And Cezanne's approach was a very different one. He was more interested in the structural analysis of nature, and he can be called the godfather of cubism. In a letter that he wrote to Emile Bernard, which was a contemporary artist, he wrote the following. Deal with nature in terms of the cylinder, the sphere, and the cone, all in perspective. And these are all important ingredients in cubism, as you will see very shortly. And Seurat approached it again very differently. Seurat introduced pointillism, in which a zillion small dots are placed on the canvas. By the way, the name Impressionism was coined after the title of a work of art by Monet that he made in 1872. The title was L'Impression du Soleil Levant. It was the impression of a sunrise. So let's now take a look at a work by Van Gogh. Vincent van Gogh. This is a work that many of you may have seen. It's very famous. It's called Starry Night. It's owned by MoMA in uh, New York. Whenever I say MoMA, that stands for Museum of Modern Art. You see here extreme distortions in shape and color and exaggerations for emotional effects, which is effectively what we call expressionism. He painted this while he stayed in a mental hospital in saint rémy it was one year before he killed himself at age 37. He couldn't give this art away. No one wanted it. He sold only one work of art in his entire life. Let's now look at Cézanne. This is a work from 1894, it's just called House and Trees. And notice here the, the structure and also the colors, very different colors from the Expressionists. And the image is rather flat. There's almost no depth. And for those of you who are already familiar with Cubism, you can begin to see the structure that later comes back in Cubism. It's also very modest in terms of colors. And let's look at a work by Paul Gauguin. Paul Gauguin was French. And this is called the Yellow Christ. He made this in 1898. It's a biblical subject that already is non-impressionist. And the colors are exaggerations. So, yeah, you could call this again expressionistic work. He had a very poor life, very stormy life. He attempted suicide in 1898, the same year he made this painting. And he died in 1903, when he was 51 years old. And the next painting is, is perhaps, at least by some people, considered his most famous. 
We own it at uh, MFA here in Boston. It just so happens that it's on loan now, but we own it. It's a huge painting. It's almost the entire wall. And it has a French title, which he scribbled in the upper left-hand corner, which no one can read. But the, the title is D'où venons-nous, que sommes-nous, où allons-nous? Very dramatic. Where do we come from? Where are we? And where are we going? He made this when he worked at Tahiti. Now, many critics believe that this is a metaphor of man's life cycle. There's a lot of symbolism in this uh, work of art. When I see this, I always think of the central figure as a connection with the yellow Christ. But I could be wrong. If Sharon Atkins is in my audience, she said she might be coming. Uh, she will be our guide at the Museum for Fine Arts. She could talk about this painting probably for a half hour. But she doesn't have to do that because it's not there. <laughs> and so now we get a George Seurat. I mentioned already the word pointillism. He made this in 1885. And pointillism speaks for itself. There are no sharp borders. It's a whole new approach, a whole new way of looking at the world. He put small dots there. And this uh, was used by many artists later on. The dots grew and became dashes. But this was a very seminal period for him. The next work of art is by a famous Norwegian artist, Munch. He was an expressionist. And you see here a painting that many of you have seen before. He made it in 1893, and it's called The Scream. This was actually one of work of my art quiz, one of the during the past year. It's clear that he was strongly influenced by Van Gogh and Gauguin. Edward Munch had a traumatic childhood. His father was mentally disturbed. His mother and sister died of tuberculosis when he was young. And he wrote, illness, madness, and death were the black angels that kept watch over my cradle. If we look back at the days of the Renaissance, the 16th century, and then the 17th century, the Dutch artist Rembrandt and many others, then there is a clear trend. The artists are gradually removing the constraints that were put upon them by prevailing traditions. And at the turn of the century, we have reached the point that beauty in art is no longer an issue. Look at this. Now, you may find some of these works beautiful, but the intention of the artists that you have just seen were definitely not to paint something that was beautiful. They wanted to introduce a new way of looking at the world, and they did that in different ways. The reason why you now find many of these works beautiful is that their new way of seeing, their new way of looking at the world, which they invented, has become your world. Your way of seeing. Our ideas of beauty evolve. What is plain ugly 100 years ago can now be beautiful. And I want to show you today how in the first quarter of the 20th century, this process of removing constraints, of breaking the handcuffs of tradition, was completed in less than 25 years. It was a period that led to total artistic liberation. If you still think that the goal of 20th century art is to create something beautiful, you might as well leave now. And I'm not joking. Prefer that you leave through the back doors. It's one of the greatest misconceptions among people who are not educated in art. To appreciate 20th century art, you must abandon the idea of beauty. Pioneering art is a new way of looking at the work. And those work of art can be very interesting. They can sometimes be stunning. And sometimes they can knock me out. But I prefer not to use the word beautiful. That can be very confusing. The beauty of a pioneering work of art, no matter how ugly, is in the meaning. I'm willing to go as far as stating that if you find any contemporary work of art beautiful, say of the past 20 years, that's worrisome. 
A new way of looking at the world is never the familiar warm bed. It's always a chilling cold shower. Someone is leaving. <laughs> so now we're ready to enter the 20th century. And I will follow the outline that you see here on the blackboard. You will find some of these works beautiful. That's fine, of course, but it's your problem. So let's start with Matisse, a real giant. He was French, he was 31 years old at the turn of the century. And you see here Matisse, it was his wife, Amelia, in 1905. It's called a green stripe. What a powerful statement. Notice there is a light and there is a dark side, a warm and a cold side, divided by the green stripe. The left side of the background is red and the right side is green. And if you compare these background colors with the different colors of the face, they're almost reversed. Some refer to Matisse as the apostle of ugliness. The art collector Leon's Leo Stein referred to this work as the ugly and incoherent. And the American journalist Burgess wrote about it. Matisse took the first step into the undiscovered land of the ugly. He was probably not very educated because others did that already before Matisse. <laughs> Matisse was one of the leading figures in a movement which is called Fauvism, which stands for wild beasts. Fauvism is really not a new concept, it's a form of expressionism. And they pushed the envelope of non-natural colors to the very edge. The colors were loud and violent. They went even beyond Van Gogh, Gauguin and Munch. In a news newspaper article in Le Figaro about an exhibition of Fauvist, you can read the following, I quote, a pot of paint has been thrown in the public face. I doubt whether anyone in my audience has problems with this painting. This way of seeing which was pathetic at the time, has become your way of seeing. And therefore we love it. At least I do. In the same year, this was 1905, he painted another painting of his wife, not unlike this one. And Leo Stein called it the nastiest smear I've ever seen. But he bought it. In 1907, we have the infamous blue nude. That's what it's called. Notice in this painting the very dark outlines of the body. It's very typical for Matisse. And this work is considered by some his most ugly of all. And maybe you and I can even agree. In 1910, Three years later, I saw this in Leningrad. At the time that I was there, it was still called Leningrad, at the Hermitage. It's a huge painting. It's called The Dance. It's a masterpiece. These dancers are floating in space. There's almost no depth. And look at the simplicity. There's only, basically only three colors. He worked one year on this painting. We have a similar one at MoMA, New York. It was made one year earlier. But the colors there are very different. It's the same, same idea. <coughs> 1911, goldfish and sculpture. I'm sure that all of you see the goldfish. And you may see the sculpture. But do you recognize the sculpture? Who does? Yeah? I think so. from the previous painting. You just saw it, you saw the painting. It's the blue nude. He made of the blue nude, he made also a sculpture. 
and you see the sculpture there in his studio. You see the same position of the woman. Let's now move to Picasso, he was Spanish. And he is arguably the most important artist of the entire 20th century. In 1900, he was 19 years old. He was influenced by post-impressionists and by Matisse. He moved permanently to Paris in 1904, and most of his early works reflect suffering, cold, poverty, which he himself experienced as a young artist. You often see beggars and blind people. That's in the period 1901 to 1904. And we call that the blue period because blue was dominating many of his works. 1901, a painting that we have at Fockhart. So for those of you who go to Fockhart, you're going to see this. Mother and child, a lot of sadness. Another 1901 painting, also in his blue period, also at Fockhart. That's why I selected these two. You can clearly see here the influence of Matisse. You see the very dark black outlines. 1905 was the beginning of what we call his pink period, when he fell in love with Fernando Olivier. The change of color, many of his works, not all, are dominated by pink, and there's also a change in the subject, the more cheerful. This was the year that Fernando moved in with him. I'll show you a work of 1906, whereby pink is not so dominant. An extremely famous painting of Gertrude Stein. She was an American writer, an art collector, and she had an art gallery with her brother Leo Stein, whom I mentioned already. They had the art gallery in Paris. And already early on, they bought works by Matisse and by Picasso. And Gertrude asked Picasso to paint his portrait. Now, Picasso was unsatisfied with the face of the portrait. And after eight zero sittings, this poor woman went through 80 sittings in his studio in Montmartre. After 80 sittings, in her absence, he redid the face completely based on a mask of an Iberian sculpture that he had seen at the Louvre. <laughs> Iberian sculptures go back 600, 400 BC. And when you look at her face, it's like made of stone, some kind of ceramic. It would seem that if you hit it, that it would shatter. And when Gertrude and others protested that the portrait didn't look like her, Picasso said, if she doesn't look like it now, given time she will start to look like it. <laughs> and some people say that's actually what happened. <coughs> Gertrude bought it. I'm now going to show you a painting which is considered by many art historians the most important painting of the 20th century. It's called La Demoiselle d'Avignon. And this picture was taken in 26100, which is the lecture hall, <laughs> at the time that the uh, that MoMA temporarily stored this picture in 26100. <laughs> and since I lectured there for freshmen, they had the pleasure of seeing the artwork. At the same time, I'm doing a daredevil experiment, which is actually a very dangerous experiment, but that's a different story. With Demoiselle, which we normally call it, Picasso began to decompose his subjects and viewed them simultaneously from different angles. It's unsigned, and Picasso gave it no title. It is a brothel in Barcelona. I can do better for you. Here you see it, five prostitutes. He worked on this 
almost in complete seclusion for eight months. And this caused some problems with Fernande. Now, the influence of African masks is immediately obvious. And for those of you who are not familiar with African masks, I brought one of, our, of my own collection so that you can make the comparison. Countless articles have been written about this painting and what brought Picasso to make it. The, in, the influences include many things, photography, the Iberian sculptures, as I mentioned already, African masks, non-Euclidean geometry and the concept of time and space and much more. Even his closest friends and admirers were shocked. His friend, the painter Derain, said, a painting of this sort is an impasse at the end of which lies only suicide. <laughs> and Matisse was outraged. The Steins did not buy it. Picasso kept it from public for almost 10 years. And the American journalist, Burgess, called it a terrible picture through the chaos and the monstrous monolithic women. This is a verbatim quote. And it was ver first exhibited for the general public in 1916. But many insiders and artists saw it way earlier. It was not recognized for its seminal value until 1920. I want to show you a, a detail of the person on the right. Not surprising that this painting caused an earthquake. And notice that there is the beginning of what we later begin to call cubism, the slicing and looking at the object simultaneously from different angles. 1907, turning point in the history of art. He made this work also in 1907. It's called Mother and Child. When I saw this in Paris at the Musée Picasso, it truly knocked me out. This is an incredible work. It's clearly post de Moselle. And I want you to compare this in your mind with the mother and child that I showed you of 1901, the blue period. From 1901 to 1907, only six years. Total change. A complete different way of looking at the world. The Fauvist, George Brock, saw Dumbozel at uh, Picasso's studio, and he was shocked at first, but soon began experimenting with the same concepts used in this, in the Dumbozel. And under influence of Cezanne's work and the work by Picasso, he jointly with Picasso developed what is now called cubism. And I repeat myself because it's very important in cubism, the subject can be viewed from different sides simultaneously, and it can be broken up, dissected into planes, and reassembled without any depth. And Brock's immediate response to the Moselle was a painting called Standing Nude, made in 1908, and he worked six months on it. And here you see Standing Nude. Typical for the early days of cubism, are often these colors, these brownish, blackish, very modest colors. Brock submitted seven paintings to be exhibited in Paris, and this was one of them, and all seven were rejected, at least at first. But Matisse was on the jury, and he was allowed to accept one. And so he picked this one. But Brock was so angry that he withdrew them all seven. That same year, Picasso painted also a standing nude. This standing nude we have at MFA, Museum of Fine Arts. For those of you who go there, you'll see it, and it's hanging. It's not hidden. And you see again the same color treatment. It's not too different, except that the person is sliced even further than the Brock. We call this analytic cubism. You watch, you can view the person different angles simultaneously. 
In the period 1908 to 1914, there was a very close collaboration between Brock and Picasso. They knew that they were breaking new ground. And in some letters, they referred to each other as Wilbur and Orville, after the Wright brothers. Can you imagine? They write each other letters, Wilbur and Orville. I don't remember who was who. They knew they were breaking new ground. It is sometimes impossible to tell a Brock from a Picasso. 1908, Brock. If you see this one, you may see the connection with the work of Cezanne, which I showed you earlier. And of course, also the work by Picasso, Dumoiselle. This is called Big Trees at La Stac, which is a town on the Mediterranean. I think the inference of Cezanne is very clear here. 1909, Picasso. His love, Fernando Olivier. Clearly posed Mademoiselle. This painting could not have been made prior to 1907. And now I will go three years back to 1906, prior to Demoiselle, when Picasso was in his pink period, the same woman, his love, Fernande. Look at this. What a difference in three years. This is clearly pink, by the way. That's the pink period. Then, at the height of Cubism, the portrait made by Picasso of Willem Oude. He was an art collector and he had an art gallery. Look again, the space around him. And he himself is broken up into planes and they're reassembled. It's like shattered glass. There's no depth. Now the next two paintings were part of my art quiz of the week at the Center for Space Research. And I will give you a chance to test your expertise. I'm going to show you two works of art. They were both made in 1911. And one is Brock and the other is Picasso. So if you're ready for this, This is one work, very typical for 1911, 1912. If I didn't know anything and people would show me this work and they say, when was it made? I would say 1911, 1912, roughly. So look at it. Try to digest it. And I'll show you another one, made in 1911. One is Brock, the other is Picasso. Any ideas, any suggestions? It's unfair because clearly it is practically impossible. And of course with the art quiz of the week, 50% of the people had it right. <laughs> now in 1911, Picasso fell in love with Eva. So in 1912, Fernando moved out and Eva moved in. Eva died in 1915 of tuberculosis. And Eva, can you still show this work? Yeah. And Eva is called Marjolie. He called Eva Marjolie. And for those of you who speak a little bit of French, it speaks for itself what it means, Marjolie. And look at the bottom of this painting, Marjolie. And if you really know your art, this gives it away. You have to know a little bit more than just the artworks. You have to know about the artist. This gives it away. This is the Picasso. And the other one was the Brock. In 1912, Picasso made another invention. This painting is called Glass Bottle and Guitar. He pasted a piece of cloth on a painting, which we call a collage. And this was a key step in art. To paste something from your familiar surroundings, from daily life, 
piece of fabric or wallpaper or a newspaper on a canvas was a real breakthrough in art. We cannot think of contemporary art, art without it. And Brock's first collage was also in 1912. This was not Picasso's first, but it was also in 1912. You see the newspaper there, Le Figaro, speaks for itself. So if we now take a look at our schedule, the outline. So we are now uh, have arrived at um, the Blauer Rider, Kandinsky. Kandinsky was Russian. In 1900, he worked in Munich. Kandinsky went through a spectacular evolution between 1900 and 1914. In the period 1908 to 1914, he lived with an ex-student of his. Her name is Gabrielle Munter. She was an artist in her own right. They lived in her house in Murnau, which is in southern Bavaria, in Germany. And you can visit that house. It's very interesting. If you get a chance, I recommend you do that. And in 1911, Kandinsky founded a movement which is called Der Blaue Reiter. I wrote it here in German which means the blue rider. And this title was after one of Kandinsky's uh, paintings. And the other members of the movement were Gabriel, of course, and Franz Marc, who was German, and several others. And Kandinsky was one of several artists who paved the way to non-figurative art which is often called complete abstract art. But I make always a distinction between abstract and non-figurative. For me, non-figurative means there is no connection with any form that you recognize from nature. And non-figurative art is a complete new chapter in art. And several artists arrived at this more or less independently at the same time. And I want to mention them all, all five. It was Kandinsky, it was Picabia, it was French, it was Kupka, who was a Czech, and it was an American, Arthur Dove. And then there was a Frenchman, Robert Delaunay. And who deserves really the credit for being first? I don't know. I've spent a lot of time on that, but I've given up. It's very clear that it was in the air, so perhaps it wasn't so important to know exactly who was first. It was in the air, there is no question about it. But it was a giant step in the direction of breaking the handcuffs of tradition, of liberating art. One day, Kandinsky walked into his studio and he saw a fabulous painting. And he said, who put it there? It was his own upside down. <laughs> and then he rea re realized that figurative presentations could be negative. I want to show you works by Kandinsky first in 1903, because I want you to appreciate the staggering evolution of this man. 1903. Amsterdam, that's what it's called, Amsterdam number 52. Impressionistic. Yeah, I would like to say Nothing special. 1903, nothing special. Six years later, when he lived at Murnau, 1909, a mountain. When you go to Murnau, there are lots of mountains around Murnau. A huge transition from 1903. It's clear that he is already on the way to non-figurative art, although you can recognize the mountain and you can recognize people. Color treatment is wonderful. The way that the mountain is almost double there. You can see this in Munich. It's a fantastic collection in Munich called the Lenbach House. They were donated by Gabriel Munter. In 1910, 
It is believed that this is then the first abstract ever, the first non-figurative work ever. This was by Kandinsky. It's not very large. I've seen it at Pompidou in Paris, about this big. It's a watercolor. And in 1912, Improvisation number 26. The title Improvisation number 26 gives the false impression that it's non-figurative, because improvisation, you know. Is it non-figurative? No, it's not. Look carefully, and you can certainly identify three people. Look closely, see whether you can find them. And what are these people doing? They are rowing. Three people, each two oars, that makes a total of six oars. And I hope you can count. So this is absolutely not non-figurative, but again, you know, he is on the way. But this is after 1910. So if he can be really credited for the person who made the first non-figurative work, that may be fine, but he abandoned it. 1912, he was again figurative. And then in 1914, I think it's fair to say that he was then completely non-figurative, but I'm not so sure even, because I do see there some mountainy forms, and maybe he was still thinking of his mountains in Murnau. When he made this, it was shortly before World War I, and he had to go back to Russia. So I think this is a good point, perhaps, to, to have an intermission, now that we have made the key step towards non-figurative art. It is clearly a new way of looking at the world. Emotions, ideas, and feelings can now be expressed without any natural forms. At the end of the next hour, I will give you forms to indicate your preference for the museum trips. Enjoy your intermission, and by all means, take a look at these books if you're interested. We will reconvene on that clock exactly at 3 o'clock, on that clock, regardless of what your clock reads. The role of American artists during the first quarter of the 20th century is very modest. However, to make the Americans in my audience feel good, I want to show you one work by Arthur Dove. He was doing cutting-edge work when he made non-figurative art already in the period 1910-1911. And there it is. It's called abstraction number two. MFA has quite a collection of doves, actually. They don't have the early ones, but they certainly have quite a few non-figurative works by Arthur Dove. And so you will get a chance, many of you will get a chance to see that. So I now want to mention Franz Marc, who was a member of the Blauer Rider movement, uh, he is one of my favorite artists, I must admit. Strongly influenced by Cubism, he was German. Unlike Kandinsky, who was not so strongly influenced by Cubism. And so here you see 1911, Franz Marc, the woodcutter. And the influence of Cubism is obvious. Mark is best known, perhaps, for painting animals with very bright colors. And the next work, Three Red Horses, which he made in 1911, this is not a very nice reproduction. We own this at Busch Reisinger Museum. Busch Reisinger and Fockart are two different museums, but they are physically connected. And so when you go to Fockart with me, you automatically go to Busch Reisinger. 
So you'll see both collections. And this one is at Boos Reisinger. It's a quite large painting, actually. It's a little larger even than you see it there. Three red horses. I want to show you a work he made in 1911, which is called The Yellow Cow. No surprise, of course, that it's called The Yellow Cow. And this was part of my art quiz. So it was a work of art. It was put on the right side of the bulletin board. And then the question is, who made it? There was a very clever woman in my audience who won this year. She won the first prize. Her name is Leslie Fink. And she went to Google and she simply typed in yellow cow. <laughs> Out popped Franz Mark. <laughs> I don't know whether that's the reason that she won this year. But in any case, it's amazing. Isn't it amazing? You go to Google, you type in yellow cow, and out comes Franz Mark. The power is radiating away from this painting, clearly influenced by yeah, almost everything. Cubism, uh, Fauvism is as Fauvist as you can have it. Although you wouldn't call him a Fauvist, but that's really where it came from. Wild colors, violent colors. And then in 1914, he is completely non-figurative. It's called Battling Forms. You can see this in Munich. It's non-figurative. He died in 1916 in the First World War. He's not the only artist who died in the First World War. He was 36 years old. Robert de Launay, he was French, had a lot of contact with the group in Munich, with Kandinsky's group. In 1906, when he made this painting, he was 20 one year old. It's called Landscape with Cows. With a little bit of effort, I'm sure you can find the cows. You see them there on the right side? I think I see four cows. If you had to put a, a label on this, you would say, well, post-impressionist. You see the dashes, probably went back to the days of Seurat. 1906, that is prior to Dumoiselle. Therefore, not a hint of cubism. There couldn't be any hint of cubism, because that was not invented until 1907. But now look at 1910. Eiffel Tower. This is post-Dumoiselle. This is cubism. You remember the painting I showed you of Willem Ude? With the shattered glass. Well, same idea. Robert de Launay, I mentioned earlier, is one of the five people who I consider to be among the inventors of non-figurative art. And the next work that I will show you, he made in 1912, which is called Circular Forms, The Sun and the Moon. And if he hadn't added the words the sun and the moon, he might have claimed that this is non-figurative. But he's well on his way, just as you saw Kandinsky's work, 1909. And then in 1912, the axe falls, and he paints this work, which is called First Disc. And most art books, or many art books, actually call this the first non-figurative work of art of all time. Some say, no, it's really the 1910 Kandinsky. It's not so important. As I said, it was in the air. It had to happen. I want to mention Fernand Léger, who is French. He was not connected with the Blue Rider movement, but he's one of Susan's favorites. And he's very much part of the Cubist movement. And so for more than one reason, not only to please Susan, which may, may pay off one way or another, uh, I will show you one painting by Fernand Léger. 
Yellow staircase. You recognize it? Oh! <laughs> Please. But you may want to enter now the art quiz. Fernand Léger, 1913, called Yellow Staircase. The people look like robots. Léger was fascinated with the industrial age. People are like machines. And he uses tubular forms. And he was called the tubist. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Tubular forms, cubism, put it together. He was called the tubist. The sixth floor of building 37. That's why it's now. But no one has yet given me the right answer. So we are now here, dealt with all this. Futurism. Futurism was born in Italy in 1909. It evolved from the age of modern technology and from fast photography, the multiple exposures on one image from the late 19th century. And there was a bizarre manifesto in 1909. It's a bizarre text, but you must understand most manifestos are crazy. It always comes down to one thing, that all art that was made before that moment is utter garbage. But from that moment on, the second, the new thing, that's really going to be it. So don't be surprised that you hear strange language, but I want you to hear some of it. Very important in the movement was the beauty of speed. I can live with that. But they glorify, and now I quote, war as the only cure for the world. That's more worrisome. <laughs> and it glorifies militarism and anarchism, and it wants to demolish museums and libraries, and it fights feminism. I don't know of any woman, by the way, who was a member of this movement. And they write, we want to deliver Italy from the gangrene of professors and archaeologists. And in spite of all this, they really delivered some great art. And the key players were Boccioni, who also died in the First World War, and Bala, and Severini, and many others. If you go to Folk Art Museum, you'll see a stunning Severini. I want to show you two works by Bala. The first work he made in 1912, it's called Girl Running on a Balcony. And when you look at this, even if it's 1912, it really doesn't have any cubistic influences. But clearly it's futurism, multiple exposure, one image that came out of photography. And as far as the, the way that it is painted, yeah, you could say post-impressionism, you know, the, the dashes, but not a hint of cubism. Yet cubism played a very important role in futurism, almost, or I should say many works of the futurists are strongly influenced by cubism. And in fact, cubism in a way was the catalyst for this movement. The manifesto was written in 1909, two years after Dumoiselle. The next work by Bala is clearly influenced by cubism. It was made one year later in 1913. It's called Dynamic Expansion and Speed. And it's non-figurative as well. It had already been invented. Cubism had been invented. Non-figurative art had been invented. It's combined in one. I want to say a few words about the German Expressionists. Now, Expressionism really goes back to the 16th century, to El Greco. There's distortion of shape and color and an exaggeration for emotional effects. That was El Greco. However, the name, in general, is only associated with Van Gogh, Gauguin, and Munch, and then with the movement that followed in Germany, 
which was founded in 1905. They called themselves Die Brücke, which means the bridge. And frankly, I might have left it out completely if it weren't for the fact that we have a very nice collection at Busch Reisinger of the of Die Brücke. And it's very much worth seeing. And it's therefore that I decided to show you at least one work of the leading artist in this movement, who was Ludwig Kirchner. Ludwig Kirchner was German, a German expressionist. He made this work in 1914. It is a street somewhere, I think it's Berlin, it's called Friedrichstraße. And when you look at this uh, work, it's a wonderful mixture. Futurism, cubism, bright colors. If you look at the size of the head of the woman, both actually, in comparison with the body, you see a deliberate distortion. That's expressionism. Kirchner committed suicide in 1938, one year after Hitler declared all the works of the German expressionist as degenerate art. He called it entartete Kunst. It was outlawed. And some were destroyed, and most were sold. And the other players in Die Brücke were Erich Heckel, Otto Müller, Karl Schmid Rotluf, and Emil Nolde. And the reason why I mention them all by name, that you will see at Busch Reisinger a wonderful collection of all these people, every one you will see. If you go to MFA, you will see a very nice Kirchner. What is interesting about these people, that even though they're all members of Die Brücke, their styles are very different. So go to Busch Reisinger. You can see it for yourself. So primitism. Kazimir Malevich was Russian. Manifesto in 1915. I warn you, manifestos are always crazy. I quote the words from Malevich. Suprematism is the beginning of a new civilization. I tell all of you to reject love. Throw away the baggage of wisdom, because your wisdom is insignificant and ridiculous in the new civilization. I have untied the knots of wisdom and liberated the consciousness of color. Creation exists only where paintings present shapes that take nothing from nature. So clearly non-figurative. Man feels a great yearning for space to break free from the terrestrial pool. Uh, the very basic forms in suprematism are squares, circles, rectangles, and crosses. And Malevich uses only very few colors. It was a vehicle for Malevich for his spiritual ideas, almost like a religion for him. So primitive paintings were the most radical, non-figurative paintings that were produced up to that time. It had an enormous influence on the development of art, designs, architecture. Let's first look at a Malevich from 1910. It's called The Bather. All right, you're now experts when you look at this painting. What influenced him? 1910. Look at it. Give it a shot. In the worst case, you're wrong. Excuse me? Ah, the black lines. Matisse. I think Matisse above all, but probably also Cubism, I think. But yes, definitely Matisse, there's no question. Deliberate distortion in all respects, color, shape. You can see this in Amsterdam. 1912, Taking in the Rye is the 
title of this one. You remember the tubular shapes by Leger, 1913? Well, you see the same thing here. And I'm not suggesting even that they copied it from each other. Clearly, that's influenced by cubism. But again, the people are like machines. They are like robots in a way, just like they were in the 1913 Yellow Stairs by Leger, Fernand Leger. I'll give you a second chance to be proud of you. 1912, what influenced him? Come on, it's staring you in the face. I see African masks, don't you? No question, African masks. 1912. And now comes the real first suprematist work. Looks like a red square. It's not quite a square, look carefully. It's not a square. He didn't want it to be a square. And he even gave it a title, Peasant Woman in Two Dimensions. Now, like in science, dates are important, and that's also the case in art. And Malevich is suspected that he has predated some of his works. He knew he was breaking new ground, and he thought it might actually look better later if he would predate them. This is not really proof, but there's a lot of evidence for that. Therefore, some books, some art books, may show you this work and they may say 1913, but other art books may say 1915. It was exhibited, an exhibit in Moscow in 1915. It's possible that it was before 1915. It's not clear that it was 1913. It's interesting, the parallel between science and art to be first with groundbreaking work, and then perhaps even change the date. In 1915, that's well established, the black square, this, the paint is flaking. This is one of the early versions, he made several. And the black square became to symbolize suprematism. When he died, this was carried along with his funeral. The same year, 1915, eight rectangles. You can see this in Amsterdam. It was part of my art quiz. This is a stunning painting. Now, why is this a stunning painting? This work in isolation would have meant nothing. But knowing the history of art, Knowing the evolution and what led to this makes this a great work of art. This work, and that is true for a lot of art from the 20th century, can only be appreciated if you know about art, something that laymen do not appreciate. When Lenin came to power in 1917, it took him only a few years to realize that this is elite art, which cannot be appreciated by the common man. And that was clearly not part of the idealism of communism. And by 1920, all the works of the Russian avant-garde, including this, were effectively forbidden. And it was dangerous to make this art, but it was even dangerous to own it. And Hitler came to the same conclusion in 1937. He had a huge list of forbidden art. I mentioned that earlier, the Arte de Kunst, degenerate art that included Van Gogh, Picasso, the German Expressionist, and of course also the Russian avant-garde. Here you see a Malevich that we have at MoMA in New York. Composition, black and red square. 
The interaction between the two squares may have had a political meaning, I'm not sure. This was just prior to 1917, to the October Revolution. And the red may have made reference to the Bolsheviks who were fighting the white Russians. Unfortunately, there are no Malevichs in the Boston area. Bush Reisinger used to have one on loan. I've seen it countless times, but they had to give it back. It's no longer there. If you want to see some great works by Malevich, you've got to go to either Amsterdam or to MoMA, New York, or Russia. So now, looking at the blackboard, I'm getting now to neoplasticism. I'll raise this for you. Piet Mondrian. He was Dutch. He was a giant. Piet Mondrian is the inventor of neoplasticism. There was a manifesto in 1917. The language was not so ridiculous, by the way. It's austere geometrical abstract. He stated art should be denaturalized. Well, that means non-figurative. That was all by itself certainly not new. He uses straight lines and rectangles and right angles in relation to the frame. So his straight lines at 90 degree angles in relation to the frame. And you will see that in all his works, almost all his works, after 1919. And he used primary colors, again, after 1919, 1920. He used the primary colors red, yellow, and blue, and then he has black, white, and gray. And he is striving towards what he calls universal harmony. And this is partly driven by his conversion to theosophy in 1911. He worked in Holland, in Paris, briefly in London, and then in New York, where he died in 1944. His work had an enormous influence on the evolution of art, of architecture, typography, and designs. If Mondrian would see me with these glasses, he would be proud of me. <laughs> His evolution is staggering. He went through post-impressionism, cubism, and arrived in 1920 at a new visual language, a new way of looking at the world. I'll take you back to 1905, Prix de Moselle, Piet Mondrian. I just wanted to make sure that you realize that he was Dutch. <laughs> it's a windmill, 1905. That is the same year that Matisse made the green stripe. Now, in all due respect for Piet Mondrian, I would like to say that Matisse, in 1905, was way ahead of him. 1910, a church in Holland somewhere, south of London. 1910, post Demoiselle, but yet not really influenced yet by Cubism. Post-Impressionism, yes, definitely. One year later, 1911, ah, ah, cubism. You can clearly see it. This is a flower pot. It's still figurative. The influence of cubism is obvious. 1913, this is called composition number seven. It is probably non-figurative. It's not clear. Cubism is sort of in the background, but he is already breaking away from cubism. And then 1915, two years later, composition number 10. This is called his plus-minus period, for obvious reasons. <laughs> And you may think that this is completely non-figurative, but it probably is not. Because there are other works that he made prior to this, which I think he called the Pier in Domburg, 
and the pier is something that sticks out in the water. And if you look at the bottom of this painting, something is sticking out. He may have that in the back of his mind, but it is possible that it is completely non-figurative. 1915. He clearly broke with cubism. But this work could not have evolved without cubism. 1917. Composition number three. Color comes back. And this painting, let's face it, is unlike anything that was made before 1917. There's just nothing that you will find that is like this. And then in 1920, he made the big break. What now is generally called neoplasticism. The primary colors, the black lines, 19 degree angles relative to the frame. And this work is from 1921. Give this some time, look at this. Clearly non-figurative, no connection anymore with nature. You see the three primary colors, you see the black lines. For those of you who sit very close, you may notice that not all black lines extend to the edge of the frame. Why do I mention that? Whenever that is the case, the work was made either in 1920 or 21 or 22. Always gives you a clue. We have a Mondrian at Bush Reisinger from 1921. You will see the black lines are not extended all the way to the edge of the frame. It's very easy to identify when he made it, if you see that. If you ever see in his works Two narrow vertical lines, parallel, close together, we call that the double line, then you can be sure it was made after 1931, because he did that first in 1932. I went with my daughter Pauline, who is in the audience, countless times to the fabulous Mondrian collection in The Hague. And she was able, even when she was this tall, to estimate the dates of his works to an accuracy of plus or minus one year. The evolution is so strong in Mondrian that if I take you around for a few hours, you can also do that. Past 1922, it becomes way more difficult. At Pompidou in Paris, I noticed a Mondrian which had the double lines on it. It was dated 1927 by the curator. I pointed out was wrong. It's impossible because he didn't make that prior to 1932. When they admitted, they said it was a typo. 1927 had to be 1937. I remember I was in Germany at a museum and there was a Mondrian that had this general structure that you see here with the three primary colors and the black lines and it was dated 1917. I pointed out to them that that couldn't be because he didn't make this prior to 19. 20. Last but not least, Marcel Duchamp. He was French. He became a U.S. citizen in 1955. Marcel Duchamp is unquestionably among the top five pioneers of the entire 20th century. And like Malevich and Mondrian, he moved through various stages very quickly to arrive in 1913 at one of the most important artistic inventions of the entire 20th century, which he called himself ready-mades. I'll first take you to 1910. The Duchamp that he finished 1910-1911. He called this, always provocative titles, he called this Bush. You can see it in Philadelphia. And when you see it, 
Whom do you think of? Pauline? <laughs> Matisse. Matisse, absolutely. You know, you may think of a lot of things, but Matisse comes to mind right away. 1910, 1911. 1912. This painting caused a big turmoil. This is called the nude descending a staircase. Futurism, cubism. This was exhibited at the famous armory show in New York in 1913, which also came to Boston. And that was the first time that European avant-garde art was shown in the United States. There were Picassos, there were Duchamps, Matisse, Marc, Léger. All familiar names for names to you now. The Cubist and the Futurist Exhibition Hall was referred to as the Chamber of Horrors. And Theodore Roosevelt saw the exhibit and said, this is not art. Duchamp made his first ready-made in 1913. He just took a bicycle wheel, which he didn't make himself. He did not make it himself. And he turned it upside down, mounted it on a stool, which he didn't make himself. The original is lost, but you can see a copy in Philadelphia. In 1915, he took a snow shovel, he signed it with his name, and he wrote on it, in advance of the broken arm. That was it. In 1917, a very provocative ready-made. He called it Fountain. But we know better. That is a urinal. He signed it R. Mutt, M-U-T-T, -T, 1917. The manufacturer was actually Mr. Mott, M-O-T-T. -T. Very typical for Duchamp. He always gives it just a little twist. Now for the 50% of my audience who is not used to using urinals, I can assure you that the position is wrong. It's rotated. <laughs> and that too is typical for Duchamp. The twist. Always a twist. This was submitted for an exhibition in New York. And the rules for that museum were that nothing can be rejected. So they accepted it, but they didn't show it. <laughs> the original is lost. A copy was made by Marcel Duchamp much later. And this was bought by MoMA in San Francisco two years ago for $1.2 million. Now, during this period, Duchamp was part of the Dada movement. There was a manifesto in 1916. It was a revolt against traditional values, no surprise, because all manifestos are revolts against tradition. The Dada artists wanted the right in art to dare to do anything. I want to repeat that, the right in art to dare to do anything. Duchamp sure as hell lived up to that. <coughs> Another ready-made, 1919, called Air de Paris. He asked the pharmacist to open an ampule, which was filled with liquid, and empty it and seal it. And that's what it is. And so it's filled with air from Paris. That's why it's called Air de Paris. It was meant as a present for Walter Arnsberg in the United States. It was a friend of his, he bought a lot of Duchamps. And this is really the birth of conceptual art in which the idea is more important than the finished product. And this became a major movement in the 60s. So you have to know what's behind it to appreciate it. And this is often the case for 20th century art. Without knowledge, you don't get very far. And I want to show you a ready-made of the first quarter of the 21st century by a not-so-well-known physicist, Walter Lewin. 
And it's called Air de Cambridge. <laughs> it was made by a glass blower in Newton, and she sold it to me in building 10 a few weeks ago for $20. <laughs> and I asked her to open it and to reseal it, to make sure that there is indeed Cambridge air inside. And you have my word for it. I can sell it for you for much less than $1 million. <laughs> it's really a bargain. And let's face it, it's even more beautiful than Duchamp's because it has colors. Here it is. <laughs> Why am I telling you this? To copy an idea is easy. It's not interesting. Art is full of copied ideas and derivatives which have nothing to add. It's not interesting and it is worth nothing. Well, in this case, maybe twenty dollars. In 1919, Duchamp took a postcard of a reproduction of the Mona Lisa made by Leonardo da Vinci, 1506. And he painted a moustache on it, the post postcard size, he gave it a beard. And at the bottom, he wrote five letters, L, H, O, O, Q. And if you pronounce this in French, just like you would spell the letters in French, L stands for she, and H is the H. So if you do that quickly, it reads elle a chaud au cul, which means she had a hot ass. <laughs> Rather provocative, but that was Duchamp. Desecrating something considered almost holy by the public. Few museums have Duchamp's. Most of his work can be seen in Philadelphia, the Ironsberg collection. And with the ready-mates, Duchamp ended the struggle that had lasted several centuries to eliminate, eliminate all constraints of tradition. It was the moment of complete artistic liberation. Not only was beauty no longer an issue, that was already the case in 1900, but even familiar mundane objects like a snow shovel and a urinal were elevated to art. After Duchamp, anything goes. I've shown you the evolution that led to this. Impressionism, post-impressionism, expressionism, fauvism, cubism, non-figurative art, 1911, 1910, futurist, die Brücke, suprematism, no, neo neoclassicism, and then ultimately there was Duchamp. His impact on art was enormous. His prophetic contributions were fully realized in the mid-50s when the pop art movement was born in the United States. Warhol's Campbell Soup, his Brillo boxes, Rauschenberg's tires, he used whole tires, he used chickens, he used a goat, Klaas Oldenburg, his baseball bat, his baseball glove, his soft toilets. Kandinsky wrote, and I quote, art always has its root in a particular age, but art is more than just an echo and a reflection of an epoch. It has a prophetic energy that reaches far and deep into the future. This was certainly true for Duchamp. There are some remarkable similarities between science and art. In both there are pioneers who break new ground. And those contributions are the most interesting and they can change our lives. But there's a big difference. Science can be right or wrong. That is not the case with art. Art can be good or bad, but it cannot be wrong. Art is not verifiable like science. And in science, you can also make some predictions about where it will be going. The holy grail today, 
is the dark energy, which makes up 70% of the energy in the universe, and we don't know what it is. The unification of the four forces, grand unified theory. And then the question, is there life on other planets? The future will tell us one way or another. That doesn't exist in art. Which way art evolves is unpredictable. It's driven by many circumstances. I mentioned photography, technology, wars, politics, but also by prophetic vision. The pioneers in art look at the world in a way that did not exist. They are creating a new way of looking. As Kandinsky said, it has a prophetic energy that reaches far and deep into the future. And that is why I love the pioneering works above all. Thank you for being here. Now comes something very important, <laughs> the museum visits. The interest is overwhelming, more than I had hoped for it. And so both museums have agreed to have two possibilities. Already two days from now, Friday, at 2 p.m., MFA. And the guide, our guide will be Sharon Atkins, she is here. She just came to me, she's sitting there. And then there's another visit, and Sharon again will be the guide next Tuesday at 2 p.m. And Fockhart Bush Reisinger, Friday the 23rd in the morning, and then Monday the 26th in the afternoon. There is a limit on each visit of 25 people. So that means you don't have to be a mathematician, that there are 100 slots. So 100 people can go to one museum. Or 50 people can go to two museums. And many of you want to go to two museums, and I don't blame you. We will now hand out forms, and I want you to fill out on those forms what your preferences are. And then I somehow have to make a decision, and I will try to meet your wishes, but it's already clear that in some cases, or maybe in many, you will have to be told sorry. But for sure you can probably all go to at least one museum. So if you can start handing these out here, give me a hand, and hi, right, there you are. Chuck, you are the director of a museum. Pat, hand these out. Can you also give us a hand?